Gender reassignment is a surgical procedure or procedures by which a transgender person's physical appearance and function of their existing sexual characteristics are altered to resemble that socially associated with their identified gender. This bioethical topic is used as a treatment for gender dysphoria, which is the uncertainty of one's gender assigned to them at birth. Many public figures and celebrities have come out as transgender, which has allowed the public to come out as well and the issue to be more accepted by society. Celebrities such as Caitlyn Jenner, Laverne Cox, Chaz Bono, and many others have made a significant addition to the transgender community. Of course, this topic is highly opinionated. Many people, on the contrary, believe that one's gender is assigned to them at birth and therefore should not be altered. Others believe the change of one's gender is against religious beliefs. Since getting a sex change has become so popular, society has labeled them as the transgender community. In this analysis, we will be going into depth about the topic of gender reassignment itself, as well as provide a variety of numerous examples which explain the discussion even further and take on both sides to this bioethical topic. Now, let's look at these two sides and the points of interest that commonly come up around the bioethical issue. Firstly, in terms of an individual's autonomy, people who are pro generally believe that individuals have the right to decide whether or not they want to undergo gender reassignment surgery, which goes along with the increasingly value of autonomy in today's society, with Canada going as far to create legislation that allow the government to remove kids from their home if their parents oppose the new transgender ideology. On the flip side, many people, religious or irreligious, believe that gender is something that is assigned to you at birth and not something that should change in a surgery. With many religious viewing our bodies as gifts that are made in the image of God and not something that should undergo gender reassignment surgery. Second point of conflict is around the procedure itself and whether or not a surgery should be allowed that removes healthy organs. As the procedure of gender reassignment surgery involves removing healthy organs from a body, many people worried about what if the person changes their mind when they are older and want to have children, while the opposite side, people argue that procedures such as vasectomies and tubal ligations are very much legal and have the same effect in the sense that it results in infertility. The third area is around the surgery being used as a treatment for gender dysphoria. The DSM-5 classifies transsexuality as a psychiatric disorder, so people using physical means to treat a psychiatric disorder often sparks conflict. Those who are pro-argue that transsexuality itself has be shown to be ineffective when trying to treat it using psychiatric means, And why deny someone the ability to feel better when a report showing transgendered individuals quality of life after the surgery to be 69.5 compared to 60 for those who receive hormone therapy and 53.3 who don't receive any treatment. On the other hand, others believe strongly that surgery should not be used to treat a psychiatric disorder just to make them feel better. When put in the context of other psychiatric disorders such as anorexia, We would never let anyone who is anorexic undergo surgery in order to decrease their body weight in order to feel better, so why allow it for people who have gender dysphoria? With both sides constantly conflicting around gender reassignment surgery, allowing laws and regulations has been tricky and seen to raise many ethical issues around. In the 21st century, one of the key bioethical principles is autonomy and the right a person has in making their own decisions. Ultimately, the issue of gender reassignment comes down to whether or not people have the right to make the autonomous decision to undergo gender reassignment surgery. So by having legislation around who can have the surgery, issues arise around denying individuals autonomy. Also, gender dysphoria often results in significant distress and in terms of beneficence, gender reassignment surgery is tricky. In one sense, the surgery can be seen as something that can benefit the individual and increase their quality of life with a study showing that transgendered individuals 
who have had the surgery. However, at that point, the benefits outweigh the harms and the high-risk surgery and the complications that can arise from it, such as fertility loss and hematomas, which means that the division of the benefits outweigh the harm and isn't so clear-cut. The different risks of surgery can also begin to draw on the concept of non-maleficence. The primary duty of a medical profession is to do no harm. The surgery causes harm as it can create negative impacts and involves removing healthy organs from a person, an action that goes against the goals of medicine. But by not doing the surgery, harm within the individual still occurs. So deciding which harm is more justified or acceptable is a major issue still occurring. It is due to these harmful impacts, as well as that issues arise over who can undergo the surgery. Gender dysphoria is a very real condition, so if this is the case, shouldn't everyone have an equal access to the surgery no matter the age of economic ability? Currently in Australia, a transgender individual is not eligible to undergo gender reassignment surgery until they are 18 years old, and with the surgery itself being very expensive and often not covered under, under medicine, the issue of injustice occurs as not all members of the population suffering from gender dysphoria have equal access to the treatment of surgery. So with all the current options of both intervention and non-intervention carrying significant risks to the physical and mental health of a child, the question arises on what changes we should make as a society. Current policy to use puberty blockers as the first stage of treatment can be considered a wise decision since delaying the onset of puberty allows the individual more time to explore their identity through psychological counseling. However, access to such services in Australia is extremely limited, with only two publicly funded transgender health facilities available in Melbourne. As a result, patients can be found waiting up to 18 months before they're able to bid, begin consultations with a psychiatrist. Considering the increasing number of patients with gender dysphoria, it is necessary to decrease the duration of this waiting time. One possible solution is to increase funding to both the Monash Gender Dysphoria Clinic and the Royal Children's Hospital Gender Service. Enlarging the number of resources available to these transgender health facilities will allow them to expand their clinics and hire more counselors. With more psychiatrists and clinical psychologists available to take on patients, we are able to cut down the waiting period, allowing assessments and treatment of gender dysphoric patients much sooner. However, when we consider that some patients are waiting up to 18 months, will the sole increase in counselors be sufficient? Another possible solution would be to enroll the assistance of general practitioners. By training GPs to perform competent psychological assessments, we can divert the traffic of patients away from the transgender health facilities. By having GPs trained to approve treatment, we allow clinical psychologists to focus on psychological counseling of those who truly need it. Thank you so much, and we hope you enjoyed our presentation.